have fun combining it with <coughs> machine learning. And I'm always looking for feedback, collaborators, students, so I appreciate the chance to talk. Uh, the topic I'd like to discuss is valuing actions. Yeah, and this is joint work with my student uh, Galen, who should be here. We <laughs> texted me saying he's here. Uh, and um, there's his photo, so you can spot him. I think he'll be here soon. Uh, <clears throat> so just uh, one slide executive summary. Uh, so we ultimately what we do is we value the NHL players um, <clears throat> by assigning values to their actions, and that it goes up. So that's a very traditional idea. Uh, the novelty is in how we evaluate the actions, <coughs> and that is by estimating the chance that an action affects the uh, <coughs> who scores the next goal. And then how that's a very complex thing to estimate. Um, <coughs> so in this talk, I talk about using a neural net uh, for um, doing that estimation. So I think this topic of how to evaluate actions is very important, and I think there's been uh, a breakthrough in sports analytics in recent years on how to do that. And it's not really fancy technical stuff, it's more conceptual how to think about this problem. So I'd like to spend some time on this high level idea. Uh, and the high level idea is to evaluate the action by expected uh, success. <coughs> and um, it's actually come out with the conference. Uh, players create not necessarily direct goals, it's great if they can score, but they create chances to score. Um, and as Micah was explaining, whether they actually score uh, depends on other factors that are not always under their control. Uh, so I introduce this level of notion of threat. I think that's become quite accepted. Um, for example, the, the hockey data wrote a nice blog post on how we should use expected goals uh, to evaluate shots rather than um, actual shots. Um, and I even read about this in the Financial Times. So the idea of looking at expected outcomes uh, seems to be um, <coughs> getting a hold. But when you look at something like shots, you can look at the immediate effect. You can say, what's the chance that this shot goes in or not? Um, <coughs> and um, uh, you can, the question is, can you extend that idea to actions other than shots? And um, We've seen some work on this. Uh, Thor is, uh, has been very inspiring for me by Michael Shuckers, where he, he actually evaluates all actions. But it's still within a limited uh, time bound, a limited interval. And actions often have indirect and delayed effects. And Rashil, I think, made this point very nicely. I think he's absolutely right. You have to look at these chains of events. <coughs> so I often think of. Uh, the Canadian uh, gold medal goal in the Vancouver Olympics, yes? So Sidney Crosby manages to carry the puck into the offensive zone with three players on him. Okay? He still gets in a shot. He gets the rebound, passes it to Iggy. Iggy makes the assist, back to Crosby, and boom, the great moment in Canadian history. <laughs> and that's a whole chain of events, and I think Crosby should get credit for every one of them. In fact, when I watch that, uh, when I watch that, I'm often impressed. The initial zone entry is almost the most impressive part compared to scoring the goal, because he's got these three guys on him, and he's still managing uh, to create that situation. And so, uh, how can we evaluate events? Um, in terms of how they affect possibly complex chains. And um, we can do that if we look at the chance of success not immediately, but in the future, down the line. So let me give you some uh, examples to make this concrete. And I think uh, maybe the first clear development of this idea is in basketball. So sorry about that, but uh, I want to give them credit. This is from the Harvard Sports Analytics Group. Uh, Luke Bourne, actually is a colleague of mine as a view, who's decamped to be uh, Vice President of Analytics at the Sacramento Kings, so I hope he'll come back. And they were asking questions like this, so let's say the Spurs have the ball 15 seconds left, okay? so there's still time to go. What's the chance that at the end of their turn they're going to get three points? Okay, so not immediately on this throw, 
at the end of the whole event. Uh, Pettigrew, also from Harvard, extended this to uh, hockey, where he looked at in-game win probabilities. So he made a chart like this. This is for a Flyers game. Sorry, these are a bit, a bit small. I, due to help hookup, I cannot show you a bigger one, but I can just tell you what happens. So he plots at every point in the game the chance that the Flyers will win. Okay? So at the, in the first period, he's estimating here what's the chance that they will win at the end of the game. Okay, so you can really see this idea of going all the way to the end. And when you do that, you're basically computing this huge expectation over all the possible ways that the games could unfold. Okay, so that number is summarizing a lot of information about how things might go. And you can see here, well, nothing much happened, nothing much happened. And then there's the first goal by the stars, and that brings down the chance of the flyers. Okay, nothing much happened, nothing much happened. Okay, uh, oh sorry, the flyers score, flyers score. Um, the stars score. One thing to note here, okay, let's go to the end. Uh, at the end, the Flyers get a game-winning goal, and that has a big impact. And by impact, I just mean the difference in win probability. Okay, so when you look at a diagram like this, it's very natural. Impact is just how much are you increasing or decreasing your chance of winning. Here, uh, the Stars store, uh, store one goal, putting them in the lead, and another goal putting them in the lead, and that does not have so much impact because they were already leading. So this model can weight different goals according to how important they are. And that's what we really want to do. What it doesn't really do is uh, evaluate all actions. It just looks at goals and some penalties. So these small kinks here are actually uh, teams drawing penalties. But nothing like pass, reception, and so forth. <clears throat> and also, you see that um, things like penalties, uh, OK, and why is that? Well, there's a fundamental problem. If you manage a pass in the first period and you ask, what's the likely effect of that uh, on your winning chance, it's going to be very, very small. right? So it doesn't show up. So then in a Sloan paper in 2016, uh, we propose, instead of looking at winning, looking at the chance that a team scores the next goal. Not within the next minute, not within the next two, within any amount of time, but are they going to be the next ones to score? <coughs> and um, uh, so then we can make a similar chart. So this is actually from a neural net model. And we're just doing this for the third period, uh, Blue Jackets or Penguins. And you can already see that we get a lot more information uh, in terms of what's happening in the game. It's not just these flat lines. Uh, so here, for example, here's a goal by the Penguins. And um, you can see, so when they score, uh, their chance of scoring goes up to one because they managed it. But even before that, you can see the model here, it's getting excited. It's like, oh, the chance of scoring is going up, 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 and then they score. Okay, maybe you have to be a graph lover to get excited. <laughs> 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 to me, it's like, okay. Uh, it's like, okay, anyway. Um, similar, then the Jap uh, Blue Jackets, get a, they get a PowerPoint, so they increase that chance of scoring, oh, it goes down. Increase, goes down, up and down, up and down, and eventually they score. <clears throat> and then when you, uh, and similar to Pettigrew, once you have this, the ability to estimate this, then you can look at the impact of an action, right? So you can say, okay, this didn't lead to a goal, but um, it increased their scoring chances. <clears throat> so that's what I say. So the, the big takeaway to me is if you can estimate the chance of future success, that could be defined in different ways, but let's say winning or scoring the next goals, then you can assign values to actions. And one more point I want to make about this, so sometimes people, even some of my best friends, say to me, oh, Oliver, but how can you value defensive actions? Because if you're talking about scoring the next goal, uh, defensive actions don't help you with that. That's actually a bit of a fallacy. Uh, and that's because, if you notice here, the two lines always move exactly up and down. Uh, this is easy to see with winning. If I decrease your winning chances, I increase my winning chances. Right? So similar with scoring the next goal, if I decrease the chance that you score the next goal, for example, I kill your power play, 
then I increase my chance that I score the next goal, for example, when we go back into um, even strength. Okay, so this really works for all kinds of actions. Yeah? yeah what's that based on, sorry? The, the fact that you kill a penalty and then that inc you increase your chance now of scoring the next goal? Yeah, because uh, if we're just looking at, at, if we're just asking who's going to score the next goal, while you're on the power play, you have an elevated chance, right. right? And then I bring down your chance. So, so our chances will basically always add up to one. Okay. Right? So, um, and so I bring down your chance, I increase mine. That's also why it's important to look down the line, right? That's not true if we just ask, are uh, you going to score in your uh, penalty or not? Yeah. Uh, uh, there is a chance that there will be no school sport. Yeah, that's true. So I shortened so, this. So, yes. so, so it, it, it may decrease chances of both teams to score. Or yeah. For example, the bowling pool yeah. increases the chances for both teams to score. Right. Yeah, both teams, uh, yeah, or even neither team could score, right? Yes. So I said bowling pool is a very rational event. It, it yeah. Sort of, it, it, it raises the chance of both teams to score. Yeah. So, uh, so I simplify this discussion a little bit. Okay? But um, if you look at, for example, okay, one of three things has to happen. My team scores next, your team scores next, nobody scores next, right? So that's going to add up to 100%. Yeah. <clears throat> um, OK, so that is, I think, the big idea. It's not even my big idea. It's the, uh, Luke and the other Harvard guys. So now, OK, so if you can estimate, say, winning chances, scoring chances, um, then you can evaluate players. But how do you do it? Um, and this is where I want to talk about a bit about how we do neural net. There's really no amount of time I can explain the details of training a neural net. But at a high level, so that I can help, help you give an idea of when you might use it. So if you think about this mathematically, we can say, well, what we have is we have some game situation. And we're trying to map that to a number, right? The value ticker I've been showing you. So we have a function that matches a game context to a number. Um, and in machine learning, this is called the value function or the Q function um, because it's evaluating uh, your expected uh, return. And you can say, OK, if I want to estimate uh, this function, what is its mathematical form? Is it linear? Can I do linear regression, polynomial? I have no idea, right? No one knows. It's some huge, super complicated thing right, that takes a whole match context and gives you back a number. So what to do? Um, well, so what you can do is you can use what's called a universal function approximator. If you look in the statistics text, you'll probably find this under non-parametric non statistics, where you say, um, there are these formalisms that can approximate any function. Okay. So I don't have to guess, is it polynomial, trigonometric? Uh, these things, there are theorems that say, uh, with enough data, these uh, approximators will um, give you a good estimate for any function you like. It's not magic, or it's challenging, but in principle, this can be done. And neural nets is what uh, people in machine learning use nowadays. Um, so for when you, for example, uh, if you talk to Siri or Alexa or Google, it's a similar problem. We have the signal, which is your sound waves. It's trying to map that to words. Who ha knows what that function looks like? So they use a neural net. Um, and uh, I can explain a bit more about how it works. Um, but um, really, you can treat it as a black box, and many people do. So we feed a play sequence. Uh, the network has all kinds of nodes. We have over 100,000 nodes in this, all kinds of connections. And um, this thing is like an artificial brain. That's why it's called neural nets. <coughs> and it runs, in our example, for five days. Okay, so you can think of it, it's like it's, the program is using its artificial brain to watch NHL videos from one season for five days and keeps trying to guess who's going to score the next goal and keeps rewiring its connections so that it gets the best guess. Okay. Um, there's an area of machine learning called reinforcement learning that actually most of it is about 
estimating expected future success. So it does exactly what we need. So we can apply that. Uh, you may have heard of Google's DeepMind. They use reinforcement learning to build artificial intelligence. So for example, programs that can learn to play video games, programs that can learn to read lips, programs that uh, learn to play Go. Um, we uh, worked through uh, the neural net was trained on sportlogic data. We've actually also used NHL.com data to build a, a similar model. Okay. And so maybe I'll, I'll leave it at that. I can try to explain a bit more about neural nets. <coughs> but, um, I would, let me sort of show you what that does. So we're going to have um, a black box now that gives us a game situation, gives us back, back a value, and then of the of evaluating what the player did in terms of how what they did uh, affected um, the chance of scoring the next goal. And now we can evaluate the players. Um, okay. And so if you do a ranking, um, you get a very reasonable ranking, I think. And one of the things you can do is you can identify players with relatively low salary. So we picked out here Johnny Gaudreau, Mark Scheifele, and then I was like, okay, let's see what happened. Next year, they actually got a much bigger contract. Of course, in the NHL, and directly map performance to contract to salary, but seems like some validation. I'll show some more systematic evaluation of that sort later. Um, and, um, what else I want to say? and it's not just, for example, driven by goals. Like if you look at Taylor Hall, he comes out on top of our ranking. Has excellent goals, excellent points, but not not exactly at the top. <coughs> so pick something else. Um, we looked at standard stats, so we take it from the hockey community. Okay, uh, they're, they're standard stats because they capture something important, maybe not everything. Um, and we said, okay, so if our metric is good, it should capture, it co should correlate with these game-changing events that standard stats often look at. Uh, so we looked at points, we actually looked at 14 different ones, I can show you more details, but um, just looking at the correlation with points. If you look at plus minus, actually has a low correlation with points, kind of shockingly low to me <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, then there is uh, some work on uh, goals above replacement, wins above replacement, you may have seen the war uh, website. That does better in terms of predicting points. Expected goals does quite well. So to my mind, this is already starting to show the value of looking at expected outcomes. Uh, scoring impact is um, basically the same idea presented uh, that I've explained now, uh, version 1.0. So this is our 2016 Sloan paper, where we used a uh, discrete model. So um, <clears throat> everything is explainable. And it's not a black box. Uh, I can tell you exactly what state the match is in. Say about that. And that does pretty well. And then the neural net um, actually gives you even bigger correlation. So, um, and we have a bunch of different metrics too, and show more evaluation. Uh, if you look at contract um, uh, more systematically, and say again, plus minus, uh, so we're asking, we're looking at 2015 16 season, we're looking at the value of new contracts in the following seasons. Uh, plus minus, again, not a good indicator. You know, it's not zero, but not particularly good. The above replacement metrics do better. Expected goals are already getting up there. This is our previous model. And then the neural net pushes this a bit further. Uh, one thing that's interesting is that uh, for a whole bunch of these models, actually, um, sorry, metrics, the correlation two seasons away goes up. Okay, so I made a little plot for that. Uh, so one way to think of this is, if you think of these players as undervalued, so these have high metric values but low salaries, uh, these are contracts after one season, contracts after two season, you can sort of eyeball it and see that the number of undervalued players goes down, two years down. So this suggests, I think this needs sort of careful work to really evaluate, but it's an intriguing phenomenon because it suggests that uh, the metrics provide an early signal so the metrics already say, end of 2016, this guy is great. But it looks like, uh, in many cases, it takes the team uh, another, no, not just one year, another, sorry, yeah, one more year to really um, kind of catch on to that. So that would be useful. But, okay, that's interesting. 
<coughs> okay, so uh, I should wrap up. So uh, I think the big insight is that if you can estimate the chance of future success, um, you can assign values to all actions okay, in a way that captures context, that captures indirect effects. effects. Um, now that's a very complicated thing to estimate, right? Uh, how does my pass now affect the chance that we'll score um, in five or ten minutes? Um, and uh, you could do this with neural nets. Um, that's what we're showing in this work. Um, then we get a new, um, a new uh, performance metric and it seems to correlate well with, with the good things that we wanted to correlate with. It seems to do have predictive value for new contracts. Um, I want to, wanted to mention a couple of limitations in future work. Uh, so one limitation is, as I said, this is a black box. So our, it gives you a number, it says, okay, now the uh, stars, <coughs> sorry, now the penguins have a 60% chance of scoring the next goal, but why, we don't know. Our previous model was not a black box. Everything was explainable. So we, and if you read our paper, for example, we discuss, okay, how much more valuable is carrying the puck than dumping it in, when and where. You can get all that out of the previous model. Taylor Hall is ranked at the top. Uh, why? We break it down. I said that one of the main contributors is the fact that he gets an unusually high number of blocks in this specific region of the rink. So previously, we were able to interpret and explain everything. The neural net inside its brain, it has all this knowledge about the NHL play, but you kind of need to get it out. So we're thinking of uh, ways to extract the knowledge from it. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much. <laughs>
doing something related, and they also just looked at the average player. But yeah, I think those are two great ideas. I'd like to, I'd like to get more students to help me work on this. I have a job. Your question right here. <laughs> yeah. Um, first off, thank you. That was very interesting. Uh, how much more effective was your model that used the sport logic data versus that which just used the publicly available NHL data? Yeah. So the um, yeah, I'm trying to think a bit. We because we had a, the data set is a bit different actually. With the NHL, we had seven seasons worth, but and they're different. But I would say actually, in terms of the ranking. It was already quite good. Just using the just using the NHL, NHL, yeah. Because when you're doing the ranking, it's this huge aggregate, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, like, I don't think you know if there's like a point two difference in some ranking, it doesn't matter so much. You're trying to get the magnitudes right, and it's already doing that. Um, I think if you were, if you really wanted to get um, like this ticker, right, right? If you really cared about, like, is it 0.7 or 0.68, then maybe the sport logic would be better. But for this ranking, it was, it was pretty good. And I think, actually, we could improve the, the model that we had with the neural net. Yeah, so, so I think if I was doing player ranking, I'm quite happy. I'd be quite happy to use the NHL. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. One more question? <coughs> Thank you. Um, I was curious, and I apologize if I missed a slide on this, mm. but I assume you did, um, I guess, sort of out-of-sample validation in terms of how well the model predicted goals or predicted wins, or um, I guess you could do that two ways. One, by actually feeding through the set of actions that happen from games, yeah. or even just once you're done training, mm. then say, okay, now let's just simulate, given what we, these learned parameters on each of the players, what is the expected outcome of these two teams matching up? Yeah, so we did some of that, although that hasn't been published. Um, so we mainly looked at, because <coughs> we look, uh, actually we evaluated mainly in good how good it is for player ranking. So for player ranking, I have some charts of this, we looked at if you're, say, halfway through the season, how good is it predicting what's going to happen in the second half? And that's actually another place. Um, Sorry, I'm not on my own laptop, so I cannot pull it up. But uh, that's another place where uh, our metric beats the other metrics for most uh, this one. Um, in fact, so it's, uh, it's actually more, it needs fewer data to be predictive, the neural net approach. That's a good point, I didn't want to fill that. Uh, on the NHL data, I also wanted to mention um, we didn't, we, uh, we posted our NHL data set and we posted the model. So it's all on my website. Um, uh, but we didn't use, NHL actually has the spatial um, locations sort of hidden, not on the website, but it's hidden in the JSON. So we didn't use that. So, yeah, we can get this. Um, yeah, so we, uh, we're just starting in terms of really how good is it at predicting the scoring. We're just kind of working on that. But the ranking is good. Thank you very much. Yeah, That's great. Thank you. As we get our next speaker ready, I'll call up uh, Jeremy Sylvain.